Gilad Barnea is visiting us from uh, Brown University. He's a colleague in the field of olfaction. He actually did his bachelor's degree at Hebrew U, so welcome home. And he got a tour of the market today, so he also gets the smells and the sights of uh, Jerusalem. He then did his PhD in New York University with uh, Joseph Schlesinger, and then moved to the laboratory of Richard Axel in uh, Colombia. And uh, following his postdoc with uh, Axel, he got his own uh, position where he is at now. Yeah, so welcome, Gilad. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the invitation, and it's great to be here. <coughs> In fact, it's really coming home because I, I've not been here except for once, I think, since I graduated in '89, and um, I have people in the audience from basically all my stations in my life since my military, since uh, Ari came here also. <laughs> so he was with me in, the, in my military service. I have. A, a professor who taught me um, the basics of um, molecular biology, Hermona, and Michal, who was <laughs> keeping me on time to finish the, the, the BA, and then the PhD, I have a skip, but then I met a view when I was in, uh, in Richard Axel's lab, so it's really exciting to be here, to meet old friends, new friends, and um, students. So I'll talk with you today about um, two and a half projects. Um, that we are doing in the lab. Most of it is, is still unpublished, but we are in the process of writing it. Well, the first part, the first half is unpublished, and we are writing it now. The second part is, uh, is um, something we published last year. And um, in the end, I'll throw a few slides of my, you know, in, other in, in, in another talk, I, I put there a picture of the book, of the cover of the book, Moby Dick, because that's my... That's my Leviathan, that's my obsession, and I think that it will be something of interest to, to most of you. Um, so, I study olfaction, I'm starting this, uh, if I studied vision, I wouldn't start here, but since <coughs> I study of olfaction, I have to, to, to convince you that it's worth studying, so I'm using yet another modality uh, to, to, to illustrate the point that every organism collects information from the environment, and animals then use their brains to process this information and extract the relevant um, information that is uh, important for the survival of the species. Some animals view their environment, some hear it, some listen, to, uh, some smell it, some like the bats um, extract an information that we are not aware of at all using their ability to uh, use echolocation. For us, um, Olfaction is mainly viewed as, a, as an aesthetic sense that elicits thoughts and memories, but for many organisms, uh, olfaction is the main uh, modality by which the animal finds its food, its mate, and avoids becoming dinner for other uh, species. And the organism that I study mainly in the lab is uh, the mouse, and the olfactory system of the mouse consists of these areas. This is the main olfactory epithelium. This is the vomeronasal organ that I'm not going to talk about. Um, but um, this is the main olfactory epithelium. And this is the olfactory bulb, which is the first area in the brain that processes olfactory information. Um, the cloning of the receptors for uh, the odorant receptors that detect odors in the environment by Richard Axel and Linda Bach in 91 um, gave us the, the molecular entry into the system, and one could argue, and I would argue, that um, molecularly we understand the olfactory system probably better than, than any other modality. Um, having these, these um, tools in hand, we learned several what we call the dogmas or the rules of basic rules of the organization of the olfactory system, and they are as follows. And just to orient you, this is, a, this is a bisection of a mouse this way, and it's looking that way, so, so this is the front, this is the back, this is up and down, and you are looking at the half that is into the wall. And this is the olfactory epithelium, this is the bone in the bot bottom of the skull, it's called the cribriform plate, and this is the olfactory bulb, and the rest of the brain is here. Now what we are doing here is these are two mice 
in which we modified um, these two receptors. M12 is one receptor, P2 is another receptor, and these, these uh, genes are modified to express a marker protein, tau lac -Z. Tau is a protein that, that drags lac -Z along the axons, and lac -Z is an enzyme that can be visualized by a substrate and turn the neurons that expresses it in blue. Iris is an internal ribosome entry site. It's a, it's a molecular means to put this marker into this gene without interrupting the original gene. So the description is bicystronic. You have one message that expresses, that is then translated into this protein and that protein separately. So what we learn from this modification is as follows. One is that every, each one of these receptors is expressed by a population of neurons in the in the epithelium, this pro the <coughs> each neuron expresses only one, rece one receptor gene, indeed only one allele of each gene, and I'll show you an evidence for it in the next slide. And the neurons that express the same receptor are scattered uh, within a broad zone that is unique for the receptor in the epithelium, uh, and then all the neurons that express the same receptor converge their axons to one structure in the olfactory bulb that is called um, a glomerulus. It's very visible here and here. And each, the position of each glomerulus is fixed. So in all mice, the, the glomerulus for P2 will be in this location and the glomerulus of M12 will be in that location. Now this is, this immediately implies that uh, there is a map of glomeruli, a topographic map of glomeruli in the olfactory bulb. The one piece of information that I didn't tell you yet is that there are 1,300 genes that encode olfactory receptors. So if you think about it, all what we are is the product of 30,000 genes. 1,300 of these are taken by olfactory receptors. That I think is really remarkable. In mice, I could do, if we wanted a number game, mice have other um, um, families of chemosensory Receptor, so the total in mice is actually even higher. It's about 1,600 genes. Now here, the modification that we did here, by the way, is that we put green in one allele of P2, red on the other allele, and you can see that there is never a yellow that will be a costain. This is one of the evidences for um, the, the monoallelic expression. The, all the neurons that express P2 converge on the P2 glomerulus, and these are different glomeruli that we know. Now, what does it mean for, for other um, identification and discrimination? This is this, uh, um, I'm illustrating it in this schematic. I have here two chemicals, uh, one phenol ethanol, which is this one. It's, uh, smells, it smells to us like a rose, and hence I labeled it in red. And this is isoamyl acetate. It's like overripe banana, hence yellow. Um, these are neurons. Each one of them expresses one receptor, receptor 1, 2, 3, and so on. And then you have receptor 1 and 5 and 6 are activated by the banana smelling. Receptor 2, 3, and 6 are, are activated by the, the rose smelling compound. So you already see that the identity of the compound is, is deconstructed by the, by the identity of the receptor that it binds to and the neuron that expresses this receptor which is activated. Now what happens then in the olfactory bulb, I'm playing a little trick on you here and I'm switching organism to the fly, the fruit fly, and instead of, of showing you the olfactory bulb, I'm showing you the antenna lobe which is the equivalent uh, structure in flies to the olfactory bulb. And this is an experiment that was done by uh, Gene Wang and Alan Wang in Richard Axel's lab a while ago. In, and in this experiment, they express the protein uh, G-CAMP. It uh, responds to, um, to, to, to changes in calcium levels in, in the neuron, hence activity, by changes in fluorescence. And what you see here is two flies. This is one fly, and this is the other fly. And each fly was given different odors. So this one is isoamyl acetate, banana smelling, uh, odor that I talked with about before, and these two to us smell floral. Now, you can see that each compound activates the same glomeruli, you see, and then different compounds activate different glomeruli, although some can activate the same glomeruli. So it's exactly what I showed you before 
in my schematic. Now I'm showing you this in the, in the fly because flies have much fewer receptors, much fewer glomeruli, so we can name each glomerulus what we cannot do um, for um, mice. So what, this is kind of the end of my introduction. So if you know this and you sleep for the rest of the talk, you will not know what I'm doing, but you will know something about olfaction. And you basically know whatever you need to know about olfaction, um, I would argue. So you have one receptor per, ne per neuron, you have convergence onto glomeruli, you have deconstruction of the other identity by the, the nose, and you have then representation of the other map in the olfactory bulb, and one would argue that then the brain has to transform this um, information and reconstruct the identity of the other. That's thought to be done mainly in the piriform cortex. Now, I could convince you in many ways, but this immediately implies that if I gave you this schematic and the key to which glomerulus will be activated in response to what other, I could have had this experiment done in the next room and, and project it here, and you would mark what the fly there is smelling. So all the information is here. Now, I'm going to talk Can about... Sure, what yeah. Well, for now, let's talk about binary. I mean, it's obviously more complicated because you have lateral inhibition. It's much, much, much more complicated than that. But in the end of the day, what I'm showing you here argues that if you have, let's talk about binary system, the information is here. Obviously, to get there, you have a little bit more complicated system. Um, I'm going to tell you two main stories about olfaction. Um, one is is about how the system builds itself, kind of a, a developmental story. And the other is about another family of receptors that is thought to respond to, uh, to innate, uh, to others that elicit innate behaviors through uh, activation of hardwired system. So now I'm talking, the first part, I'm talking about um, the guidance aspect of the of the development of the system, and the system as I described it until now is the, is the main part of the main olfactory system, and, this, and the others there are more, mostly learned others. So you are born, you are not born with an innate uh, preference for banana or rolls, but you, your experience endows these this stimuli with value. The, the, the system that I will present in the second half uh, is a system that is meant to deal with others that elicit innate behaviors. It's debatable whether humans have others that elicit be innate behaviors, but I think that this system is kind of giving us an entry point. So when I talk about the development of the system, you can see in this illustration uh, already the, the, the challenge for the system in development. Because this neuron here and that neuron there are located in very different environments, and the trajectory of their axon is totally opposite, or well, not totally opposite, but rather different. Let's say this one has to go north, and this one has to go mostly <coughs> southeast. Um, this, is, this is a very different organization than all other um, modalities, because the envision, neighboring relationship in the retina are maintained in the auditory system, <coughs> the frequency <coughs> map and neurons next to each other keep the projection, uh, or the, they project to, to, to adjacent points. Everybody here knows the humanculus and all that. I mean, the projection from this point and that point is closer than the projection of this point to that point. Olfaction is different. The periphery, the order of the, of the organization of the periphery has nothing to do with the projection, and it is indeed the identity of the gene of the receptor that is chosen to be expressed by the neuron that determines its destination. So that immediately implies two predictions. One prediction is that if you alter this, the identity of the receptor, you should alter the, the projection destination. And two, you would argue that the receptor has to be not only on the dendrite, where it binds others, but also on the axon, where guidance occurs. So the first prediction, I'm not showing you the slide, but it was shown in a very nice paper by Fan Wang from Richard Axel's lab. She she swapped different um, receptor genes. She took 
the P2 receptor that I showed you before, put instead of the coding sequence, a coding sequence of another receptor, and the neurons changed the trajectory. And in, it, interestingly, they didn't go to either one, they went somewhere in the way, but the, mo but the more closer to the P2 that the receptor that she swapped in was, the closer to the, to the right glomerulus it was. For the other prediction, I generated um, antibodies to stain the receptors. When I came just for the students here, don't believe anybody, if you want to do something, do it. I came to my mentor and admired mentor, uh, Richard Axel, when I was uh, starting, and I asked him, why did you do all this fancy genetics if you could just make an antibody? He said, oh, it's impossible to make antibodies for receptor. So, come on, impossible. There's no such thing as impossible. So, well, try, and I tried, and this is it. So, don't listen to anybody. You want to do it, do it, and, and, and in the end, it, it really panned out to be very interesting. So, this is, this is uh, staining with one of these antibodies. The section is through the tissue. This is the external world. This is air in your nose, or in the mouse's nose. And these are the, this is the layer of the receptor neurons. These are the precursor cells. Um, I can show it here because I'll use it later. Olfactory epithelium is one of these places where there is constant uh, generation of neurons. So you have precursors here, uh, stem cells here. They, they differentiate, and at a certain stage, they choose the receptor and express it. These big neurons are the, are the, are the sensory neurons, and these here are support cells. And again, this is the outside world. Now, this is a, an, a staining with one antibody. You can see that the strongest stain is in this um, cilia ciliated dendritic area where the, the neuron is exposed to the external air, and you have a lot of staining in the cell body, and you can start seeing the beginning of the axon. Now, this is another fancier uh, fluorescent staining, two different epitopes of the same receptors, and you can see that the subpopulation of neurons expresses them, and they detect the same receptor. And then when we looked at the bulb, we could see the receptor protein in the axonal tip. So, so just because we are anal, we wanted to make sure that the, ax that the axons that we are labeling are indeed the axons that we think about. So we had a mouse that we generated in which the neuron that expressed MR28, or the gene for MR28, is altered, as I showed you before, with LAXZ, which we stand here, beta-gal, and um, the receptor is, is uh, marked with an antibody, and you can see it's the same glomerulus. By the way, this is a very nice way to see the glomeruli themselves. These are the dark, empty spaces. This, the blue here is nuclear staining. And you can actually see also another thing that I told you about before, which is the monoallelic expression. Only one allele expresses, this is a heterozygote, only one allele expresses LAXZ, hence only half of the glomerulus is filled with the LAXZ positive, and the rest of the glomerulus is the other allele. Um, Okay, so what does the receptor do? How does the receptor uh, do anything in order to direct the, the neuron to its uh, destination? So there are many, many models. The model that I like um, is the Sperry model in which the, the receptors smell um, secreted ligands uh, that appear in gradients in the brain or in the bulb. There is actually not a single uh, piece of data that supports this model, but it's a difficult model to support. And my hope and belief is that in one day we will either rule it out or rule it in. Uh, but until then, we do what we can. And one model was that in the end, so it's a multi-step uh, process, and the idea was that in the end, when, when the neurons really coalesce on their, on their glomerular destination, there is an involvement of a homotypic interaction, interaction between like axons. Now, this, by definition, is a, is a um, um, concentration-dependent uh, event. So we said, let's change the, the concentration of a population that expresses a particular receptor. So now, if everything is, let's kind of play the numbers game. So let's say, I told you 1,300 genes. Um, I lied a little bit because 30% of them or 25% of them are pseudogenes or, or genes that do not encode an active receptor. So we are left with approximately 1,000 active genes. So if everything is equal, it's one-tenth of a percent expresses one receptor. 
So we said, okay, let's bring it up to 1% or 5%. So to do that, we generated mice that, expressing, that express the following alleles. So we have um, OMP, which is a marker for all sensory neurons in the olfactory epithelium. OMP expresses the transcription factor TTA. And then a second allele is a transgene, TETO, the response element for TTA, driving the, the expression of MOR28, the same receptor that I showed you, with the internal ribosome entry site and tau -like z So every neuron that expresses, theoretically, every neuron in the epithelium should have expressed both MR28 and LAC-Z. This approach was tried with another receptor, and they got 95% expression, and they called it a monoclonal nose. Um, since this is a transgene, there is a, um, a phenomenon called um, uh, integration, variegation of the integration of the transgene, position effect uh, variegation. That's the name of it. And, and what it means is that where the, where the transgene lands, um, the site in the chromosome where it lands affects how, if it will be expressed or not. So we chose, uh, since the monoclonal nose was already done and it wouldn't answer what we needed because you couldn't see much other than the receptor, we chose two uh, founders that express the receptor more sparsely but much more concentrated in a concentrated manner than wild type. So we have one, one founder that expresses this in 1% of the cells, so about 10 folds, and the other one in 5%, so it's 50 folds. Now, neurons that express this receptor from the transgene will be marked with LACZ throughout. Then, in order to label the endogenous receptor, we use yet a third allele, and this is MR28 driving LACZ, uh, sorry, GFP. So endogenous MR28 <coughs> will be marked by GFP. So when we look at the epithelium, this is a section through the epithelium, you see GFP or endogenous receptor is expressed only in one zone, whereas LACZ is expressed also outside of the zone. Now, if you look at the bulb, instead of the one, well, this died, so we'll go low tech. So instead of the, of the, of the wild type glomerulus, you see multiple glomeruli, okay? And in fact, we, we see about 30 glomeruli, which is what we would expect. Now, let, uh, so the, we, will, we call these glomeruli ectopic glomeruli. Now, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk yet about another population, a subpopulation of these, and that's what, what, I'm going, what I'm going to introduce here. And these are the rerouted glomeruli. Now, here we have the GFP mouse. You have one glomerulus. Sometimes when you have um, the transgene also, you have incorporation of... Um, neurons that express the transgene incorporating into, so, thank you, into the, the wild type glomerulus. In other cases, which is the more interesting ones, you have wild type fibers leave their glomerulus or not even reaching this glomerulus and innervate another, uh, other glomeruli, and we call these rerouted glomeruli. We never see that in wild type. So this is an effect of the expression of, um, of the transgene, just to remind you, the green ones do not express the transgene. So this is a cell non-autonomous effect. So it's an, it's an effect on the wild type population by the identity of their neighbors. So this is a strong um, evidence for homotypic interaction. Now, interestingly, I told you this is the 1% the expressors and this is the 5% but the number of rerouted glomeruli is, is capped, and whereas the number of, of ectopic glomeruli is, is proportional to the percentage. So that suggests that there is a, an area or a neighborhood or a cul-de-sac where the rerouting can occur. Now, with the TTA, we can play some games uh, and ask temporal questions, because TTA uh, the TTA stands for tetracycline. Uh, TTA is the tetracycline uh, response. TO is the tetracycline response element, and TTA is the is the transcription factor that that activates it. So, if you give doxycycline, which is an, an antibiotic that is um, equivalent from the family of tetracycline, you can affect the the expression. So, there are two versions of this. Uh, it's also called reverse tet and and, and 
TET, but we, we use the, the terminology of TTA and RTTA, so I'm showing you only TTA. TTA is active, constitutively active, when you don't give doxycycline, and it's inhibited by addition of the drug doxycycline in the food. And doxycycline is a very easy drug to administer to mice, and you can even feed pregnant females, and it goes through the placenta to the, to the embryos. So what we are doing here is we are asking what, how can you affect the formation of the rerouting by the timing of um, the insult that you do to the system. So in other words, during gestation here, we gave doxycycline, so there is no transient, and then we removed doxycycline, the half-life is a few days, and we waited eight months. Now I have to, I, I will show this kind of um, um, schematic throughout the talk, so I have to take you here slowly and then I'll do it faster. So some, some pieces of information I have to give you here is, I told you that there is regeneration of the neurons. So we measure the half-life of the neurons and the half-life is about two months. So we waited about four half-lives after the, the beginning, after the end of, of not allow, of, of allowing the system to, to develop normally. So here we start the insult to the system, the expression of the transgene, and we wait for half-lives. Now, green here represents the early um, MR28, the MR28, endogenous MR28 that is expressed regardless of what we are doing. Blue here is late expressing, so that's after we started the, the um, insult to the system. So here, these are just newly born um, MR28 fibers, and red is throughout transgenic MR28. So what you can see here in the, in the faint red, you see that you have um, ectopic glomeruli, but you see that you don't have rerouted glomeruli. The red and the, and the blue go to the same glomerulus. So if you let the system develop normally, and after birth you start uh, expressing the transgene, you get ectopic glomeruli, but you do not get this dragging rerouting of glomeruli. And this is what the data looks like. This is without doxycycline. So the control is is, is mouse that doesn't have the transient, obviously. And here we give doxycycline or we don't. So without doxycycline, you have the rerouted glomeruli with doxycycline. Even if you um, eliminate doxycycline P0 when the mice are born, you do not get um, rerouting. And this is what the glomeruli actually look. So you have a glomerulus here. And again, we looked at, at 10 months. You have a glomerulus here. After there is an expression of the, tr of, uh, the transgene, you see that some transgenic fibers incorporated into the glomerulus. There is an adjacent glomerulus that is positive, but you don't have dragging of the axons. That's in total contrast to what I showed you in the very beginning. Then we said, so that suggests that there is a critical period. Yeah. Yeah. The system regenerates. 60 days is the half-life of each neuron. But the, it's, not, it's obviously not in, wa in waves. It's, it's sporadic, but every neuron lives for 120 days. So it still could be an issue of a critical mass, where you do have a critical mass that was... I didn't ask you to ask me this question, but this is exactly what this uh, experiment addresses. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so exactly because of the question of AMI, we said, okay, maybe what happens here is, as he argues, that it's a matter of critical mass. So how do we deal with this? You, uh, you ablate. We have methods to ablate the whole system uh, chemically, so we can uh, have the, the drug methimazole, which is actually uh, was given to my cat with, when it was a uh, hyperthyroid. It's a, it's a drug for uh, the thyroid, but um, in mice, in the olfactory system, it, one metabolite of it kills the neurons. So we, we said, let's kill the neurons, and now they all regenerate together, and let's see if we can wipe out this um, critical period and allow the, the system to develop. And that's exactly what we did here, and the answer is that no. We cannot restart, reboot the system, in spite of the fact that everything grows uh, together now, 
we again get the ectopic glomeruli, but we do not get rerouted glomeruli. And this is what it looks like. The, here we gave the mice doxycycline just to make sure that doxycycline on its own doesn't do anything. And you see the one glomerulus. And here is the um, mouse that was treated uh, first with doxycycline, then without doxycycline, after the ablation, and you see one glomerulus. Now, then there is another question that the system allowed us to, to ask, and that's what about maintenance? Do we need the, the transient expression to maintain the, the, the rerouted glomeruli? And the answer is, again, surprisingly, yes. So if you insult the system in the beginning and then fix it, you gave doxycycline for six months, there are no more uh, transient expressing neurons, yet the newly born, glomeru uh, the newly born neurons go to the uh, rerouted glomeruli. And that's what it looks like in terms of numbers um, with doxycycline and untreated is exactly the same number of rerouted glomeruli, and that's what it looks like. So this is the one glomerulus of the wild type, and these are glomeruli, um, rerouted glomeruli, and you see that we are standing for lag Z, there is no lag Z around. We don't have any transient. So what does it all mean? Before I go to this, it means that what you intuitively know <laughs> is actually true. Um, the insult that you do to the developing nervous system, let's say in pregnancy, I would argue probably also in human, even if it's a short insult, it may have long-lasting effects in adulthood, even on neurons that have never been exposed to the insult. So the women among us have to be very careful when they're pregnant with the choices that they make. Um, it, that's kind of, again, like mom tells you, look left and right before you cross the road. But I think that this is a, it's a, it's a strongest, strongest evidence for it in a system that I'm aware of. It's also the strongest evidence for homotypic attraction in this system that, that exists because until now there were some evidence for homotypic attraction in the olfactory system, but it was mostly an effect on the mutant um, um, neurons. Here I'm, I'm showing you the, an effect on the wild-type neurons by other neurons that you manipulate. So the evidence is somewhat stronger. Then just to kind of um, finish it, uh, what, what we can do with it, um, even after regeneration, so if we do the same way, we let, we let the system um, develop uh, with the insult, with the transgene, then we do not have the transgene, but when we, when we switch to doxycycline, we chemically ablate. So we reset both um, aspects of the system, the insult that we are doing and the, the regeneration. We still have neurons that are born without a transient and after ablation. So the whole system is supposedly new. Nevertheless, something happened to the glomeruli. They were marked as targets for this uh, population of neurons. And that's what that looks like. So here, we, um, before reablation, we didn't have, we had a transient after we had no transient. Nevertheless, we have multiple glomeruli that are green, in spite of the fact there is no, that there is no red, as there is here, because here it's with the transient throughout, after ablation and before ablation. So then we said, OK, let's look. Let's switch the system in another way. Let's now force the system, every neuron in the system, to express two receptors. Now, that's been attempted many times and failed, but we were fortunate, I guess. And we succeeded to express, so we made this allele of MR28 driving C6. C6 is another receptor. So neurons that choose this allele now will express this receptor and that receptor. When we looked in the epithelium, in the C6 zone, everything is normal. When we look in the MR28, here it's in a, in a heterozygote, we see that 50% of the MR28 neurons also express C6, and that's like the yellow here. And C6 is never expressed in this zone at all. And if you look at the glomerulus, you see 
that the, the population of the two alleles innervate the same glomerulus, and you see separation between the alleles, but I showed you that before already for the MR28 iris tau like Z. So that's normal. However, what's intriguing here is that if you stain with MR28, you see that there is difference in intensity of the staining. So the, that implies that there is less MR28 present in the axon where there is um, C6 expressed. So that suggests a model in which um, there is some limiting factor that lim it can be in the protein level or in the RNA level that, that limits how much protein can be in the axon. It doesn't exist in the, in the epithelium because you cannot really see um, any difference between, any distinguish the two population here, although it may be the, the summation effect of thousands of neurons. Um, so we are now after the limiting factor. The other thing that um, we can say from this, al although cautiously, is that this is consistent with the, the, the idea that there is no um, uh, repulsion, heterotypic repulsion, because had there been heterotypic repulsion, the neurons will not know where to go expressing these two, new, to these two different receptors. Obviously, one second please. Obviously, this is clear, clearly not a, a proof of that because there may be dominance of one receptor over the other. So we are now, we have 16 um, founders or 16 chimera for the mice that express the converse, C6, iris, or 28. So now the, these neurons will express both receptors, but from the C6 uh, locus, and we'll see what happens there. Yeah, please. What we're looking at in the green, that is the axon, the axon terminal. That's the termini of the axon, yeah. Why aren't we seeing the axon in the nerve? And the previous slide, we saw the cell bodies very nicely, but we didn't see the axons there either. Right, because that's the question of level. And in fact, in the, e in the beginning, in the paper that we published about the axon, we claimed that the receptor is only in the axonal tip, but now we know that it, it, it is also in the axon. In fact, you can see here, these are axons of the, of the, of the red. It's, so these are fascicles. These are fascicles. That's the way they look. There. So you're saying that the receptor is highly concentrated in the synaptic terminal and the glomerulus. No, that's what I said in the beginning. Now we know that it's not the case. It's in the axon. But it's, lo it's in low level in the axon and in the... In the and high level in the terminal. No, but no. Sorry, sorry. In the terminal, you have 10,000 neurons. This is not a single terminal. These are, t these are the termini of 10,000 axons. My son, but earlier you showed us lots and lots of axons converging on a glomerulus. Right. And here we don't see those lots and lots of axons. Right. Why? If I showed... If let me... This is a section, and what I showed you before was not a section. So if I show you... Where's the middle of the number three? Wait, wait, here. This is the equivalent of the same if thing. It's the same question. Why don't we see the axons? These are the, the tau-lac like now. These are the same thing that you saw before. Can you put slide number eight where, where, where you began? This preparation, this preparation, this preparation is a whole mount preparation, okay? So th the mouse is looking this way, you bisect here, you remove it, you stain and you look down. You see the entire axon. The section that I'm showing you is a section through this way. It's a coronal section through here. You don't see this because you're not there. You don't I see you problem here if you don't alright. Well, I, I can answer your problem. So if you look here, if you stain here, even if you look at this preparation and you section, so here you will see exactly what you say. You will see the fascicles. Here you will see the fascicles. Here you will see only the glomerulus. What's not understood? Be the going into the How will you see the axon if you are in the yeah, glomerulus? We can okay. I to okay. So having two populations of, of two intensities of, um, of 
expression of the protein, we decided let's cross these to the um, original, the first part of my story, where we are using um, the, the disturbance with the transient and see whether this population or that population preferentially goes to the rerouted glomeruli. And surprisingly, we saw something completely different that is actually interesting. So here we see that we, or, or what, we want, what we expected to see was that we will see a, dif a distinction between the two populations. We did not see that. However, what we did see is that we, see, we saw segregation of three populations now be, be, between, uh, within the glomerulus. So these are the, the population, the red are the population that express beta gal. Um, so these are the transgenics. The blue are the population that express the two receptors. So this is the staining for C6. And the green here is the staining for MR28. You see the wild type population, the one that doesn't express either of these. The other allele that expresses C6, which is slightly less intense, and the um, transgenic expressing receptors that are the least uh, strong. So you have segregation within the glomerulus based on the, on the expression levels of the receptor. You, have, you, still, you are still good enough to go to, the, to your target, or the, new, the axons are good enough to go to their target, but they, they, they separate within the um, axon, within the glomerulus. Now, um, when my students saw this, they said that this looks almost like the, well, if they were in Israel, they would say, I, I just saw it today on the bus, they would say that this looks like the, the symbol of Tnuva. Since we are not in Israel, they said that it looks like Pepsi. And so we saw the color, the, the, the green with, with white, and this is exactly Pepsi. Conveniently, I'm going from here to the Netherlands. That's their flag. And if I twist it um, 90 degrees, uh, it's the French flag where I'm going from the Netherlands. So I'm in business. So this is the end of this story. And yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there is, no, there is no preference for, so it's not a question of levels. And it looks exactly the same. Um, so here I want to close that story and switch briefly to another story that is published. So I'm, I'll go faster on it. In the other story, I'm talking about receptors for trace amine. Trace amines are volatile amines that are relatives um, of dopamine, serotonin, uh, and nor noradrenaline, but they are not, um, they are volatile. They are found in the environment. Um, many of them have been shown to have, to elicit um, uh, innate aversion. So a colleague of mine, Steve Lieberless, who actually um, identified the receptors for um, these compounds called traceamine associated receptors, bad name, um, actually did a zoo, a zoo study and showed that one of the trace amines is highly enriched in the urine of carnivores, and they elicit innate aversion in mice. So he went to the Boston Zoo and collected, well, somebody collected from him uh, the urine of the lion, the, the urine of the bobcat, and zebra, and this and that, and he showed that, the, in fact, bobcat and tiger, I think, have the highest level of these compounds, and regardless, this compound, when it's presented to mice, they, av they avoid this space of the, of the arena where this um, compound is introduced. And these compounds are found also in co decomposing uh, cadavers, in rotting fish, and so on. Um, so Steve identified the receptors for them. What we did is we tried to look at the um, protein level again of the receptors, we made antibodies for these receptors, and um, we compared um, uh, the RNA R in the RNA level and in the protein level the patterns of expression of, the, of these receptors, and we see here for TAR4, TAR5, and TAR6, uh, three different TARs, that we see a very similar picture to what we see with other, um, with the ORs, with the olfactory receptors, and I just want to mention that the TARs and the ORs are not related at all. And there are, as I told you, 1,300 ORs. There are 14 TARs. TARs are all clustered in one cluster in the genome. And, but the, when they are chosen 
for expression, they look very similar to TARS. And here is again a staining of the, of the neuron, and in a very high magnification, you can see that the majority of the protein, again, is in the dendritic node, and you see slight beginning of axonal staining. And if you look in the olfactory bulb, again, you see the glomeruli that are stained with the TARS. Um, now, if you look in a mouse in which we modified the TAR4, one of the TARs to express TARs, to express CRE, sorry, and uh, another allele that expresses the TD tomato reporter for CRE, you see that TAR4 converges on multiple glomeruli. So about four to six, which is more than the two that um, ORs are expressed on. Now, we looked to see whether TARs are all um, whether they all converge on the same glomeruli, like um, uh, some other parts of the olfactory system, the VNO system, where multiple um, um, neurons converge on similar glomeruli, and we see that it's not the case. We have um, TAR4 uh, uh, converge on one glomerulus and TAR5 on an adjacent glomerulus, and this is another pair of glomeruli, and you see that they are also different, but if you stain with two different antibodies for TAR5, you see that they stain the same glomerulus. With ORs, I told you that the position of the glomeruli is uh, uh, fixed within the members of the species. Here we have one receptor, M71, and we have 10 animals and the locations of the um, glomeruli with respect to the midline and to the contour of the um, bulb. And you see that it's really concentrated. In the TARS, it's much fuzzier. And in fact, you see differences between two different bulbs in the, so two di the two halves of the bulb and the two different bulbs are different within the same animal. So it's, there is much more variability in the position of the glomeruli. Now, in, o in OR, when you delete the OR, the neuron switches off this allele and picks another allele. And that's presumably because of the problem of, of uh, choosing the 25% transgene in mice in us, we have 60% transient. So in, in our nose, most of the time, a neuron would choose a, a, a dysfunctional allele, so it will pick, it has a chance to pick again. So it switches off the bad allele, and it switches to a good one. In TARS, however, when we deleted TAR5, we saw, and, and, and we replaced the coding sequence of TAR5 with LACZ, we saw that LACZ persists. So th this allele persist. However, we also saw that there is a reselection of another TAR. Here I'm showing you TAR6, but here I'm showing you a summation of, of, of everything that happened. You can see expression of other TARs, TAR6, 7, and so on. And even uh, in a heterozygote, heterozygote um, choice of the other allele. And here I'm just showing you this in the level of the protein. So you see the TAR4 expressing deleted TAR5 allele. You see the TAR5 deletion that picked another TAR5, and you see the TAR5 deletion that picked TAR6. Now, neurons that pick this deleted allele converge into the, uh, appro uh, into the appropriate um, glomeruli. The red is not projecting so well here. And this, by the way, here you can see a little bit better the axon tip. This is the axon tip, but it's... Previous slide shows so the axon axon. Yeah, but that's, again, it's a question of the, of the, um, of the plane. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. <laughs> we can go to the church together. <laughs> um, sure. Or wherever you want. I'll go to the mosque with you. <laughs> um, now, that allowed us to look at the entire system, because with a certain frequency, the, the neurons that picked the wrong allele, the, 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 the defunct allele, picked every other tar. So here you see, and, and they are still marked by the LACZ, so you see that there is a band of glomeruli that are the tar glomeruli. It's, these are dorsal glomeruli, which is consistent with the notion that some dorsal um, um, glomeruli respond to innate behaviors. So what we are doing now with it is that we have the three alleles of three different TARS, TAR4, TAR5, and TAR6. And again, the idea in the field is that these um, uh, that neurons that express these receptors 
mediate um, innate responses to, to the ligands, and that the, the, um, the circuits are hardwired. So what we are doing with it now is we are asking two main questions. One, by introducing a CRE-dependent um, channel rhodopsin 2, we will use optogenetics to see if we can activate the glomerulus and bypass the whole detection part and elicit innate avoidance. So that will suggest that this is indeed um, a hardwired circuit. And two, we are using electroporation. In, we are marking a particular glomerulus for tar with a fluorescent protein, and we are electroporating a dye into this glomerulus and, and following the projections into the cortex and the amygdala line, and if it indeed mediates um, um, aversion, we would expect uh, mostly projections to the amygdala or at least projections that are more um, um, stereotyped than the projections that ORs have to the piriform cortex. In the last few minutes, I just want to show you the systems that we are developing for uh, marking and manipulating neural circuits transsynaptically. Um, this is a, a, a grave need for the, for the entire neuroscience community. Everybody is using uh, viruses to do it now, or some people are using lectins. These uh, techniques are marred with uh, difficulties and problems, and uh, in the many years that I was a postdoc in Richard Axel's lab, we were using every uh, system that you read about, and it was not uh, in the olfactory system we could show the, the different difficulties with all of these systems. So in my, in my desperation, I went back to my, to my roots in the signaling, path, in the signaling field where, where I did my PhD, and I developed um, a synthetic signaling pathway that we are trying to use to mark circuits. So I'm using this as a transition. This is a, a panel from the contemporary British artist Damien Hirst uh, of this year, the old CEO. You know, he became not, uh, notorious and famous for the uh, pickled sharks and bisected cows and all that. But he has also a series of... of, of uh, panels that have these kind of dots or spheres, and each one of them represents a different chemical. So I couldn't pass that because that's actually what's happening according to our model in the olfactory. If this is glomeruli, then, then this is it. So, so again, I, if, if we had, so why am, I, why am I interested in this? Because as a molecular biologist, in order to follow the, the transformation that the brain does to the map in the bulb, what I want to do is I want to follow the projection from the mitral cells, the projection neurons that receive input from this glomerulus. Now, what I have to tell you is yet the last part of the unity rule. So we have one receptor per, neu per neuron, one glomerulus, or two per bulb, per, um, per neuron that express a particular receptor. And then the next unity part is m one mitral cell, one projection sorry, one glomerulus per mitral cell. So each mitral cell receives input from a single glomerulus. So each mitral cell, each projection neuron, represents a particular receptor that was expressed presynaptically. Okay? Now there are about 20 mitral cells, 20 to 50 mitral cells. The new number is nine. Nine, okay. So it's going down. When I started, it was 100. So nine. Ten, ten mitral cells per glomerulus. Um, and... If we had a marker for the mitral cells that receive input from this glomerulus, we could do exactly this trick, do marker M1 for this mitral cell, and do iris tau -like Z and follow the projection. Um, but we don't. Nature cannot be that generous to us. But then actually we do, because these mitral so this is P2 neurons, this is the P2 glomerulus, so the mitral cell here, I can call it the P2 mitral cell. Right, because I told you that it receives input only from the P2 glomerulus. The only problem with it is that the genetic marker that I have is in the wrong cell. It's in the presynaptic cell. So in order to mark these mitral cells, the challenge now is a technical challenge of how do I put a genetic marker in one cell and cause an event in the cell that talks to it. Or as I put it here, you have these presynaptic neurons, you have that postsynaptic neurons, if you have something that can respond to a ligand that will be secreted from one population of neurons, you will label these neurons. That's the idea. 
So to translate that very crude idea, and that's, by the way, how nature solves it in, in, in chemical synapses with neurotransmitters. So what we need here is we need a signaling pathway. We need it to be short because every component translates into an allele that we have to introduce into the animal. And we need it to be um, clean. And we need it to be sensitive. And we need it to be selective. So clean and selective are basically the same. So what we came up with is a system that we call Tango, and here I'm showing it to you for GPCR, G-protein coupled receptors. We take a transcription factor, we tether it to the membrane, to the tail of a G-protein coupled receptors. In between the two, we introduce the cleavage site for a specific protease, so that's component one. Component two, or fusion protein two, is arresting a protein that is recruited to activate the G protein coupled receptors, and it's fused to a protease that cleaves this site. The protease that we are using is the tobacco H virus, TEV, and the site here is a seven amino acid recognition site for TEV. So there is very high specificity here. These are the two components, hence two to tango, the name of the system. The, the third component that is a trivial component is a reporter gene under transcription for control of this transcription factor. And the last component is the ligand that activates this pathway. So now you have a transcription factor that is not in the system and it's tethered to the membrane, so it doesn't activate the reporter. When you provide the ligand, the GPCR is activated, the restin is recruited, the protease comes, cleaves, the transcription factor is free to go to the nucleus and activate the reporter. And this is exactly what we show here. I'll go quickly because I assume that there are no many biochemists or molecular biologists in the, in the audience because this could be used. It's an essay that could be used for any G-protein coupled receptor that you're interested in. Um, but suffice it to say that in a an, in an cell line that includes the reporter, and here we are using luciferase, uh, under control of, um, of TTA, when you transfect, without transfection, you, you have no luciferase. When you transfect the transcri transcription factor TTA, you have higher levels of, of <coughs> luciferase. If you transfect any of the components alone, you have nothing. If you express both of them together, but without the ligand, this is, I'm showing it here for the vasopressin receptor AVPR2. So without vasopressin, you have this meager one cell. And if you put, if you add, Vasopressin, you have expression of the of the ligand. I'm, I'll skip this because here we are showing specificity. That's what we are doing for the transsynaptic um, system. We are expressing the tango parts in all neurons. We are expressing tethered form, and we are doing it for the glucagon receptor. We are expressing a, a membrane tethered form of glucagon, and we are tethering it to the synaptic protein neurexin with the long linker in between so it can cross the synapse and um, we are expressing this part only in the population of neurons for which we have a, a, a marker. We are trying it, in mice it's very complicated to do all of it because it takes, you have four alleles, by the time that you have all of them together it's two years, then you want to change something, you have to start all over. So we switch to test it in flies and actually also in C. elegans. C. elegans gives you the other benefit that there are only 302 neurons and all the synapses are mapped. So if you see a, a, a signal, you know if it's relevant or if it's background. Um, we started with the fly before we started with the C. elegans. And I don't have a picture, but um, we have very preliminary data that suggests that it may work. I'm, not, I'm very careful here. I was, I've been working on it for 17 years. This is just the... the same thing that I showed you before, but with a tethered um, glucagon in vivo, in vitro, sorry. So I just want to close by thanking the people who did um, the work, and this is with a quote for our former foreign minister in the U.S. She wrote a book, It Takes a Village. Everybody who does science knows that it takes a village. And these are four graduate students whose work I showed. This is a brilliant undergraduate who worked with me and is now a, a PhD student at Columbia. He came up with the idea to use the tethered um, glucagon. This is another uh, brilliant undergraduate who 
uh, actually establish the whole thing in flies, and then the rest of the people are doing other projects that I didn't present. So I'll take any questions that you want, including actions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so in the fly, you mean? So, yeah, we can. So, the beauty here is that unlike the questioned uh, pictures where I'm looking at the endogenous receptor, in this system we are ending in transcription. So, then you have high levels of expression. So, like any Drosophila uh, paper that you have seen in neurons where they use GAL4 UAS, we are ending with the same GAL4 UAS. So we are capable of seeing the projection. So at this point, the problems that we had is we used two flies, one um, expressing a marker, expressing the, the ligand in a, uh, under the control of a marker that, so flies have, a new, have a, uh, uh, one receptor that is expressed in all olfactory um, sensory neurons. So let's say like OMP that I showed you here. So we use this marker to drive the ligand. So that should, ex should stain all glomeruli and all um, projection neurons. Now we see fewer projection neurons that what, than what we expected. So we may have a signal issue there. And again, it, these are results from last week. In a, in a parallel experiment, we put the ligand under control of one particular receptor. There we see decent number of projection neurons, but we see also something in an area that we wouldn't have expected. So that may be reflecting a retrograde labeling, and we are not sure yet. But that's kind of where we stand, but it's, it's very easy because you are ending in transcription. It's very easy to see um, projections. What I wanted to mention also is that this is not only for, for tracing, because you end in transcription, you can put whatever the heck you want. You can put channel rhodopsin and use um, optogenetics. You can put um, diphtheria toxin and kill the circuit. You can put uh, inward rectifying potassium channel and, and hyperpolarize the cir circuit and so on. Yeah, come on. Yeah. In fact, <laughs> I, I redid my kitchen, and the person who was um, doing the, the marble um, told me that that's exactly what she suffers from. She, she has uh, epilepsy, and her canary in the mind is that she starts having hallucinatory smoke um, smell. And then, in fact, now she, she, it happens a couple of times. Now she knows when that happens, she takes the medicine and, and it, she avoids it altogether. Now, it's not known if this is because of rerouting or uh, one of the uh, centers of sources of, of epilepsy are actually in one of the areas to which the olfactory bulb projects. So the anterior piriform and, and um, olfactory tubercle, these areas are kind of close or, or, or maybe even in, um, include areas that start um, um, epileptic attacks. So it's possible that this is the case, or maybe there is something else to it. But yeah, it's a, it's a known, um, um, again, canary in the mind. I'll, I'll, I'll hijack your, your question to another exciting um, story that um, actually a collaboration <coughs> between my friend Mark Albers in MGH who is a, a physician who works on Alzheimer's and see patients with Alzheimer's and also an olf olfactologist. And together we have projects on, on Alzheimer's. And in fact, what I learned from him is that, you see, one of the main problems with Alzheimer's is that by the time that people are diagnosed, game over. Uh, the, de the damage is already done. 
Now, in, it was shown that in the prodromic uh, period, so before they have uh, memory loss or cognitive problems, um, the olfactory system is actually in multiple levels one of the first areas that is defective. Um, yes, and for Parkinson there is a whole uh, literature about it. Now, obviously olfaction is not so crucial for us. So people kind of ignore it and say, oh, it's age-related loss of, because, uh, you know, we have a lot of insults to the olfactory system by infections and sinus infections and so on. So with age, you accumulate these and there is deterioration of olfaction anyway. Um, but that, that's an active area of research. He actually used exactly the same manipulation that we used for expressing for the whole Mishagas with the receptor, but he expressed APP, the amyloid precursor protein. And there also you see effects that are cell non-autonomous. You see cell death, you see rerouting of, uh, of axons. It's, it's a very interesting, uh, we have a couple of papers and there are some others that he's Maybe there is we one last one. Okay. Questions, uh, after okay.